What's going on YouTube Metal Complex here and today I've got another interesting knife review slash knife overview to do with you guys. This is the Alliance Designs Urban EDC Ice Light. Uh, interesting little knife, I have a lot to say about it as per usual. Uh, before we get started this knife was provided uh, to me directly by uh, the manufacturer so thank you for that. Um, as usual, I'll try not to let that affect my review. Um, this knife uh, is a collaboration between a uh, custom knife maker who goes by the name of Brian Efros. Uh, and that's between him and Alliance Designs. And uh, actually, I got this information from watching Dr. Frunke's review of this. Alliance Designs is one of those companies that basically helps custom makers bring their designs to the production world so that we as consumers can have them for not nearly as much money. Oh, which is great. I think that uh, in a way that's that's very healthy for the knife community. At least the uh, part of us who, who want some of these knives, we don't want to uh, spend the uh, premium custom prices. Um, this is actually made by Rhea knives though. So there's multiple names involved with this because I, as far as I understand, this is um, exclusively supplied by Urban EDC. So Alliance Designs uh, is, uh, is helping Brian Efros bring it to the table. It's made by Riot and it's exclusively sold by Urban EDC. So you'll see a lot of names surrounding it and it can get a little bit confusing, but I just wanted to uh, make sure that, um, you know, that was clear. And by the way, again, it's called the Ice Light. Um, and uh, uh, if Alliance Design sounds familiar, it's because recently they have done a lot of production models with Ray Laconico. There's a whole bunch of very similar looking yet different models uh, available out there and uh, some pretty cool stuff. So that might be why it sounds super familiar. Anyways, let's go ahead and get some measurements on this guy here real quick. Overall length of the ice light coming in at about six and three quarter inches, maybe just a hair over six and three quarter inches. Uh, blade length from tip to scale is gonna be if you go all the way down to the bottom, it's about three inches. The actual cutting edge is probably 2.8 or 2.9 inches. Um, so pretty good on the blade to handle ratio there. Uh, let's go ahead and do some size comparisons real quick. We'll move her down up against the Ontario Rat Model 1. Rat 1 coming in at 8.6 inches overall. How about up against the Spyderco PM2? PM2 coming in at 8.6 three inches overall. How about up against the Benchmade Griptilian, or in this case, the Ritter Hogue. Ritter Hogue coming in at eight inches overall. And last but not least, the Spider Codelica. Spider Codelica coming in at seven inches overall. That's a pretty good size comparison there. You can see, um, you know, not, not an overall profile, but just like the size of the knife and length of the knife and, you know, kind of the footprint. It's, it's similar to uh, the Spider Codelica. To give you guys an example of the action here and we don't quite have it's more you kind of have to shake it to get it to close but if we can see in there I don't know if I'm really gonna be able to get this I wonder if I can get it in my light yeah just barely uh, you you know, I don't know if you guys are gonna be able to see but it is running on bearings and you know you can feel it um, I'm not gonna say that it's absolutely frictionless but it is certainly smooth um, I will give it that. And it does lock up super solid. And the detent is uh, nice and I would say medium heavy. Um, so pretty cool there. Let's go ahead and get a weight on this guy. Weight coming in at 4.13 ounces. Let's go ahead and weigh it again. 4.16 ounces. I don't think that's a bad weight, especially considering, I mean, I know this is a smaller knife, but if we take a look inside here, uh, you guys should be able to see that there is no internal milling whatsoever. These are solid titanium scales, and while they are nicely chamfered and rounded off really, really well, um, they are solid and they are th pretty thick on a small knife. So honestly, I think 4.16 ounces is pretty impressive. A lot of people are used to much lighter weight on a knife of this size. You know, take the Delica, for example. I mean, that thing weighs a lot less, but it's FRN, you know? So if you enjoy titanium, you enjoy a little bit thicker slabs of titanium, and you enjoy the solidity of unmilled titanium, um, then, you know, in terms of weight, what you're getting is a small footprint package that doesn't really, you know, and the overall weight is, is not bad at all on it. It's very close to that four ounce mark that a lot of people use, so I don't have a problem with that. 
Um, let's talk about the anatomy and materials here real quick. What we have is a very interesting and very, um, very pokey blade shape. You can see here, you know, the belly kind of sweeps up towards the tip. We have a flat that drops about 45% the height of the blade from the top. Um, actually, I mean, from the very top, but really from where this, there's a swedge there. Um, so it brings, uh, it, it's more towards the upper third of the knife, and then it extends out about mm, maybe 60% the length of the blade. The blade stock is pretty thick, um, which uh, creates a pretty robust point at the tip that all, it feels, it's very pokey, but at the same time, I wouldn't call it a frail tip. There's a lot of thickness carried out there. If you take a look at it up against the PM2, you can see there it's probably at least 145 thousandths. It might actually be a little bit thicker, um, but honestly, it feels like it gets fairly thin down behind the cutting edge. So I imagine uh, it would do very well at any um, any EDC related uh, cutting task there. I do appreciate the nice grind lines here. I do appreciate um, uh, Brian Efros uh, uh, logo there. It kind of looks like, it reminds me of a compass just with the arrows pointing in different directions. You do have some satin flats and knowing Riot, uh, I believe a lot of their um, satin flats that run, hor the lines run horizontally like that, I believe those are hand done. I don't know that for sure. It's just, that's a trend that I see a lot um, with Ria. Uh, moving down here. Oh, by the way, the blade is made out of ATS, or I'm sorry, RWL. Is it RWL 34 or ATS 34? I want to say, so I had to pause there. I've written down ATS 34, but I could be I could be wrong. There are so many steel types that I get as much of a steel snob as I am. I get mixed up. Um, it's it's the um, the uh, powder metallurgic steel that is used by Damas Steel um, when they you know combine it with that nickel based steel to create Damas Steel, and the composition is extremely similar to CPM 154. I want to, gosh, I want to say it's ATS 34, but I, I'm so sorry, I could be wrong. Look down in the comment sections, or in the comment section, I will pin what I'm actually trying to say. But basically, this uh, this steel's composition is extremely similar to CPM 154. And uh, CPM 154 is, uh, if you look back at my, um, you know, my top favorite steels video, it is my favorite steel. CBM-154 is a wonderful user steel in terms of corrosion resistance, edge retention, toughness, abrasion resistance, all that stuff. It's so well-rounded and it's easy to sharpen. Magnificent. Absolutely wonderful steel. I love that on this knife. We do not see enough of um, steels that are extremely similar in composition to CPM-154 or CPM-154 itself. So that's really cool. Uh, moving down to the um, frame here, we have a bead blasted titanium frame with a very reflective, you can actually see all the way around and me uh, doing this review in my pink shirt, that's great. Um, a really nice uh, show side uh, pivot there. That's that's really, really pretty. I like that. Um, I also really like the chamfering that's done all the way around on this knife. That's nice. A couple little lines there that are, you know, I would say uh, your pointer finger is going to interact with that. doesn't create any meaningful traction, but it does create a nice aesthetic to an otherwise very bland um, scale. Now, I don't mind that, but a lot of people would if these weren't there. So I think that dresses it up just enough to make it attractive to a lot more people. Uh, moving down here to the screws, you do have, are these the tiny size? Nope, they're a little bit bigger. You've got one step up from the teeny tiny size Torx heads that I don't like, so that's great. I love that. Uh, taking a look on the back here on the spine, you have a nice uniform backspacer. I think this looks really, really nice. Some people like there to be a little bit of jimping or texturing right here. Either way is fine with me. I think this looks really classy. Uh, moving over to the other side, we have a very interesting pocket clip that you know, at first I was like, that doesn't really go with a knife. And then the more that I looked at it and kind of felt it, um, not only do I think it it fits, but I understand the design of it. Um, you know, same, same color. The tip of this over here is actually acting as the over travel stop for the lock bar, which you'll notice does not have a steel lock bar insert. And, you know, the trend with those is that the insert is actually also used as the over travel stop. So the pocket clip is, is mega thick and has a lot of um, retention to it. You know, it's not too tight, but enough to where you are definitely not going to be, with natural force, um, just disengaging it, you're not going to be pushing that lock bar past 
um, the pocket clip and bending both of them out. Um, the other thing that I really like is that when I grip it really hard, this part right here that's sort of, it's rounded off and sort of falls, what that does is it alleviates an otherwise pointy tip to this side of the pocket clip that I think might have actually been a hot spot. You know, maybe, maybe they notice like, hey, if we leave that kind of pointed out, we don't round it down, down towards the lock bar, um, then it's really gonna dig into people's hands while they're cutting. Um, this is an example of a very, um, it's a prominent pocket clip, but it's not one that actually creates a hotspot. And I, I appreciate that. I think that's great that they did that. I mean, it seems like it was absolutely on purpose. So um, well done there on the pocket clip. Um, it's not a deep carry clip, but it's about this much is hanging out of your pocket. In terms of the overall percentage of the knife, that's a lot in terms of just how much in general of a knife is sticking out of your pocket. I mean, let's compare it to the Shaman. I carry this every single day. Uh, about the same amount. In fact, a little bit less uh, total materials actually hanging out of your pocket versus the Shaman. So I don't have a problem with that. Taking a look at blade center, you can see we are dead on there. And taking a look at the lock up here, you can see uh, this uh, carbonized lock face, not a steel lock bar in, uh, insert, but the carbonized lock face um, is locking up at about 30%. It is extremely solid. There is no blade play up, down, left, or right. I am gonna cut myself on camera one of these days. Thank gosh for all this dead skin on my fingers. Um, now, a lot of people are gonna go, oh, well, it doesn't have a lock bar insert, why doesn't, you know. Well, okay, lock bar inserts are great for longevity and slowing down uh, lock bar wear over time. They're also great in the event that it does wear out completely, wear over to the other side. You can, in theory, just replace the chip and you basically have a brand new lock bar. Um, but, uh, um, you know, as my understanding of how titanium interacts with steel is that it wears faster because titanium is softer. When a lock face is carbonized, it slows down that wear and also allows the titanium to better work harden. In theory, a carbonized titanium lock face on the steel face of the blade tang should actually lock up more securely than a steel on steel interaction. I guess that's more of a slippery interaction, which is probably why some people are experiencing lock face issues with their ZT knives, which have lock bar inserts. Now that's not to say that all knives with steel lock bar inserts um, are uh, at risk of disengaging. It's just to say that supposedly, it's my, I mean, I'm not a professional in this, supposedly uh, a, a carbonized titanium lock face will lock up more securely when it's interacting with steel. I don't have a problem with that. Um, you know, I, I feel like maybe that's, that would be a way to cut costs. It's weird now. I mean, it wasn't super weird to see this like three, four years ago, but now all these production knives, you know, that are made by Chinese companies, like almost all of them have steel lock bar inserts. And it's bizarre to me that this knife being made by Riyadh doesn't have one. I don't think it's necessarily a disadvantage. I'm just, uh, it's just kind of weird to me, you know? Um, ergonomically, we've already kind of talked about this. Um, this knife does fit in the hand. It's an example of a smaller knife that I actually can get my whole hand around. I think that's great. Um, I don't necessarily think that it really needs jimping up top here, um, but uh, I, I don't know. I kind of find myself wanting some because truthfully, it feels like a knife that I could use pretty hard. It's kind of a little, it's kind of a chunky little knife, but you have a blade shape that actually has a prominent puncture tip which means, you know, the blade shape is, is nicely uh, designed for some slicing tasks. You've got some puncture tasks, but it's also thick enough to where I wouldn't have reservations against, or nearly as many reservations as a uh, knife like, say, the PM2, poking that tip and uh, something and digging around in there. Um, you know, you just, you have a more reinforced tip. So, um, you know, I, it, it really feels like a knife that could be used a little bit harder. And maybe for that reason, I want some jimping up top. But honestly, the knife locks in pretty well despite having a smooth surface. I don't have too many fears about uh, slipping off of this knife, but it is just something to keep aware of. It's a small knife um, and there's no jimping or, or really texturing anywhere. Now, let's talk about some things that uh, bother me a little bit. The main thing that bothers me about this knife, and you guys might have noticed this entire video, I've been using the reverse flick method to deploy this knife. And that's because of the positioning of the thumb studs. Um, in order to get this knife to deploy, and if you guys watched me unbox it, it was the first issue that I had. Um, it's not, there's not a lot 
that will get me to stop talking completely and allow absolute dead silence on this channel. It is it's very rare for that to happen. I talk a lot and I generally know what to say long before I'm going to say it, even if I'm just winging it. Um, but uh, basically when I unboxed this, I went to deploy it and I had such a hard time using my thumb to do this that I it stopped me. I almost like stopped the video uh, to take a look at it and make sure that I wasn't doing something wrong. But see, I'm still, I'm having an issue with it right there. The problem is, is that where I want to be with this knife in my hand is right here. I want the back of the blade to be bracing up against my palm. I want to rest my fingers right here. And then I want to deploy the, the knife like this. Well, the problem is, is I have to reach way back here, way back here. Take a look at the uh, Ritter Hogue and this guy and just the relationship between the pivot look at the lines of the pivots and look at the lines of the thumb studs when i'm holding this knife my thumb naturally falls into the position behind that thumb stud to deploy it when i'm holding this knife i have to go it, it really is it looks like just a little bit further but as far as like bending my thumb back it's actually uncomfortable to do that and then when i'm reaching that far back it actually forces me to change positions with these fingers for whatever reason i guess to get a better grip on it and I, they kind of want to roll over and put pressure, unnecessary pressure on the lock bar, which a lot of you know when you do that, it makes it that much harder for you to break the detent. So I end up having to adjust my hands all the way down here to keep my fingers off of that lock bar and to get my thumb up underneath that thumb stud. You can do that, but it feels very unnatural, you know, when compared to what we have come to expect with a lot of these folding knives uh, that are thumb stud deployers. It's not quite a comfortable position. I realize the knives that I'm using to compare are bigger knives, but the distance between that thumb stud and that uh, pivot uh, and just the overall length of the knife, it's just, you have to put your hand in a very foreign position when you're deploying it. You're also holding on to much less material, which makes me nervous about accidentally throwing the knife, you know, when I'm deploying it. So I really don't like that. And even if, when I do adjust my hand, it still is a, a very unnatural feeling to use that thumb stud. Um, the reverse flick is great because this finger is in a, when I, you know, put my hand in the natural position I want to be in, this finger is a lot lower and I've got room to get underneath that thing, not with my fingernail, but with the meat of my thumb and flick it out like that. It's actually really comfortable and really fun to fidget with in that sense. So I'll give it that. But honestly, here's what I think. I think that was, a, that was my fault. Um, there's so much room up here between, you know, the, the tang of the blade and all this, this material up here. And while it looks nice and it, it kind of goes with the lines of the knife, I really think maybe they could have just cut this top part of the titanium off and brought it back down still where it would be well above that steel face. But you can see what I mean there. There's so much room. Bring this down. And then the thumb studs could be brought back, which does two things. One, it gets it out of the cutting path because there's a lot, there's a big percentage of an already pretty short blade in the cutting path of uh, the thumb stud. So you're getting it out of the cutting path and you're also bringing it further down, which when it's down, when it's closed is actually up. So it would be more like right here. Now in that position, yeah, much more natural. And you have even more room to get your finger underneath it for the reverse flick. That's what I think. I'm not a knife maker. I'm not a knife designer. I'm not an engineer. I'm not any of those things. So all this stuff that I'm saying, it's like, it, it, it very well could be easier said than done. You know, if Brian Efros ever watches this video or Riot or, you know, Alliance Designs, they might all be rolling their eyes going, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't know, you know, when we're designing this, he doesn't understand, you know, the obstacles we have to overcome. And they very well may be right. I don't know anything about that. Just taking a look at it and feeling it though, those are my observations. I want this thumb stud to be up here so that it feels more natural. And I would assume an easy way to do that would be to shave this titanium off and move the thumb stud back. Now, will that kind of take away from the visual design that they've created with this knife? Yeah, it will. I can, I can understand why because these lines are the, the same angle as the, the top of that titanium scale. So they might have to change that. You know, it might change aesthetically the way that some of the other lines look. You know, all of this I would imagine and a billion times more goes into designing a knife both in terms of ergonomics and aesthetics. So it's just, it's just one random guy's opinion, you know, but 
truthfully, how I have to conclude this is that is frustrating. And, and this is a nice knife. Um, and if it weren't for the price, I probably, I might still go ahead and say, yeah, you know what? I, I still can recommend it. But this is a $350 knife. Honestly, I don't, you know, that, that kind of is synonymous with Ria. When you're buying a Riot knife, you're going to pay the price for it. And Riot makes great stuff. You know, they're honestly, Riot knives are some of the highest quality Chinese knives that are out there. Um, but the combination of there being a mysterious lack of a steel lock bar insert, not, not that it's needed, but it's a weird lack of there being one. Um, that and um, the, uh, the placement of the thumb stud and... You know, it's, it's, it is a very simple design. I, I just, I don't understand where they're coming from with that price tag, honestly. I mean, if this knife was, oh boy, man, you know, it's, it's really going to come as a, a kick in the groin. Um, and I don't mean it to be that way. I'm just trying to be honest. If this knife was $230, $240, had a steel lock bar insert and was much easier to deploy, with the thumb stud and, and uh, you know, then, then yeah, I could recommend this knife. But in its current state, I cannot recommend it. If you have already purchased this knife and you're loving it, there is nothing wrong with the decision you made to, to purchase it. If you're on the fence about this and you really, really like the look of this and you can overlook, maybe you're like, hey, you know what? It doesn't matter to me. I don't like a forward deployment anyway. I like to use my rear finger. Then you're probably going to like this. So if you can justify that $350 price tag, then go for it. But if you're anywhere else on this spectrum, I would say probably not. You know, maybe if they make a different version of this down the road and they bring, bring the price down a little bit, then go for it. Because it's a really interesting design and it's a great size for EDC. And I love that it's a little bit more chunky than some of the other knives we're seeing, you know, uh, today in this size. But in its current state, it's not something that I can recommend. And I, I honestly, you know, that, that saddens me because I think it's really cool looking. Um, and it is, uh, it is a joy to deploy with the rear finger. But anyways, guys, we're going on 22 minutes here. So that, honestly, that's about all I can say uh, about this knife. If you enjoyed this review or you at least found it informative, uh, please leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like. So check that stuff out. And if you enjoy all my content, then please subscribe to my channel because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody, and have a great day.